help? Okay. Um, let me start my talk. Actually, so I'm talking about the ZODB. Um, what I'll ask is actually um, if somebody could lend me a laptop that has a. Oh, it's there? Oh, okay, I just can't see it. Okay, whoo, whoo, all right, here we go. Christopher Lozinski here. I'm a US citizen. I live in Poland now. Um, I'm starting to travel around Europe to Python conferences. I'm talking about the ZODB. It's a Python database. Implement, um, it's implemented in Python. It's optimized in C. It's a wonderful database, but many people just haven't heard about it, um, don't know much about it. And so um, when I give this talk, the first question that everybody asks me is anybody using the ZODB? People want to be on open source software, which is heavily in use. And of course, the whole Plone community is on the ZODB. If you go to their website, you can see the different um, users of it. The big one is the government of Brazil. So in Brazil, the, there are over 100 websites from the government that are using Plone. And that includes um, the president, the parliament, local, city, region offices. There are a ton of people using it. So you're quite safe using the ZODB. And in addition, there are all of the pyramid guys who use it. And so the thing about the ZODB, it's this really magical database. Because you don't have to read and you don't have to write the data. It just does it for you. It gives you this illusion that your Python objects are persistent. So let's take a look at how it does that. Oh my God. Tough to see, but okay. So basically here we have a simple account object. You can initialize it. It'll set the balance to zero. You can add money to it. You can make a deposit. You can withdraw money. If there's enough money, it'll withdraw money. And to make this object persistent, all that you have to do is subclass off of the ZODB class persistent. So basically that's the ZODB class persistent object. They also have persistent dictionaries and persistent sets you can subclass off of. Very, very easy to use. And of course, to do it, um, what you have to do, basically what you do is you grab an object out of the database, and then you operate on it. So the first thing, you import the appropriate libraries. Um, you can create a ZODDB database. You can either create it on a relational database, you can create it on file storage, or you can create it on, on, in RAM residence. Um, you have to get a connection, and then you ask for the root object. You pull that root object, and so that's the persistent object. You add stuff to it. How do you add stuff to it? Well, on the left-hand side, you can create a new account object, and you just set um, root.account1 equals that account object, and you commit the transaction. It becomes persistent. In reality, people want to add lots of objects to it, so they use something called a B tree. Um, it basically looks like a dictionary, but it's stored on the file system like a B tree, and so then they can add lots of account objects to the, to the node. And of course, you always have to commit your transaction. So notice there's no begin transaction. It's just an end transaction. And the reason is the ZODB uses optimistic concurrency control. So if you're doing something like Plone or through the web development, you don't have a lot of problem with people conflicting with each other. And so it just assumes that everything's going to go through. And occasionally when it does, when there's a problem, it'll throw an error. But mostly it just works great. So that leads to very high performance on reads. Um. It's just Python, so the first thing is how do you set something? Well, you grab, how do you set the value? You grab this root object, you ask it for the list of accounts, you give it the account name, and then you send it a message, make a deposit. So that's all it takes to interact with it. So no select, no queries. If you want to do a query where you want to see, for example, all of the account objects, you can, you can iterate over the loop um, <clears throat> for key value in the... Um, in root.accounts, you can print out the value dunder um, repr, which pr prints out a string of what the object is. So it's very easy to iterate over a large number of different classes of objects in a single node. The computer scientists talk about um, the acid properties, but it just it's a database that stores it. This, when the transaction commits, the data is persistent. It's exactly what you would expect. You don't, you don't have to think about this stuff. And the other thing, if, of course, that it has that's lovely is it keeps versions of objects. So the, all of the different tools that use it, they have a way of looking at versions. The nicest one is from Plone. They have a really nice interface. 
And so what the Plone, um, what you can do is you can look at previous versions, you can compare different versions, you can restore versions. It has a history mechanism. So, so very nice, very sweet. Particularly if you're doing any kind of through the web editing, you can see all your previous versions. When you make a mistake, go back to what it is. Okay, what am I doing this with this? Well, I'm building directories. I run one of the world's largest Python directories, soon to be the largest, um, and it's a tree, right? So um, for centuries, librarians have been organizing information as trees. There's just way too much. There's just. Oh, okay. So we're, forgive me. We're running seriously late here, but I'll just keep going for. Okay. Um, and so on the right-hand side, you can see what it looks like. Um, you can see Python, Python libraries, all the different categories. You can click into them. So very nice to organize. In fact, I'm doing a lecture later on uh, tomorrow at 5 p.m. If you haven't all gone home, I'm doing a lecture on this Python directory. It's really a taxonomy of all of the websites in the Python community. But I don't want to talk too much about that. So it's really easy to build a simple tree data structure, but you can also do much more complex models. So here we have, again, from from pythonlinks.info, I'm doing a directory of companies. So you can see for the region, Europe, you can see the country, Poland, you can see the city, Katowice, you can see the company, bloggery, and underneath that there are all kinds of different content types, links to jobs, career pages, YouTube videos, GitHub pages, just all kind of Facebook. Um, you can link to all different types of categories. So it's very easy to do a hierarchical model on top of something like the ZODB. And so here's a table of companies in Poland. I won't spend this one for France. If your company, if I haven't listed link to your company in France, I want to. Here's for the city of Warsaw. Um, here's what a particular company looks like. Okay, but I don't want to talk too much about that. Come to my talk on Sunday evening if you want. Um, how does this database compare to a relational database? Well, we all know relational databases. Um, this is very different. This is really like a tree. You think of it as dictionaries. So think of it as a tree of dictionaries, and you access it you access each one based on their string, and then you can navigate down the tree that way. So it's very easy to map a URL into any node on the tree. Um, so again, how do, if I want to iterate on the left-hand side, if I want to iterate over all the nodes in a, all the items in a node, it's really easy to do. If I wanted to do that in a relational database, in my application I have 10 different classes that could be, so that's 10 different tables, I'd have to do a join across 10 different tables to do that, to, to go through all of the items in a node. So it's way simpler and, and much higher performance to do it in the ZODB. Of course, it doesn't do everything perfectly. Um, in the relational database world, you have these select statements, so I don't have those kind of indexes in the ZODB. So by default, you just index based on the ID of the object. You say you want to index based on the age or the weight, you have to create an index. It's not that hard to do, but you have to do it manually. So there's some things it does well, there's some things it does not so well. It all depends upon your application. Um, and here we have the example of navigating. So you can imagine a URL has different segments. The first segment takes you down the first branch of the tree. The second segment takes you down further, a third segment. So it's very easy to map a URL onto a particular object and find a particular object in a complex model. Is it a graph database? Well, Jim Fulton, the author of ZODB, says it's not a graph database. I think it is. Uh, the leading graph database is probably Neo4j. Um, they just got millions and millions of dollars of investment. And this one guy, he added two classes to ZODB, one of which is a node class and the other is a link class, about 500 lines of code, and that certainly is a graph database. Turns out his performance two years ago was way better than the, than the other guys, um, than the Neo4j. How do you store data? Well, the basic thing, if you have just a single process, you store your data either in a file database or in a blob. Um, if, you have, if your traffic increases, you need to do a client-server application, so that's the, using the Zio client-server, and then the Zio server stores the information in, in the file storage or in the blob storage. If you want to store in a relational database, you can. You can use relation, rel storage either on, um, on three different databases or um, MySQL, uh, Postgres, and the other one. Or um, you can go to, what is it called, this one? Um, uh, NewtDB, which is optimized just for the Postgres, Postgres QL, and it uses its indexes more effectively. You get lots of choices. Um, here's what an application looks like. You have computers or cell phones through the internet accessing the load balancer, and that'll access three different Zio clients, which then access the Zio server. 
And of course, to get good performance, you have to have caching. So each of the Zeo clients will have a cache of the objects that it's using. Um, if those objects get updated at the optimistic concurrence and control at the end of the transaction, it updates on the server. That will invalidate the other caches, those objects that are invalidated. And those clients will then refetch those if they need those objects. You can cache either in memory or on the file system. In terms of scalability, um, at Zoop Corporation, they had multiple they had sites with 100 gigabytes of record data and terabytes of blob data. If you need more data than that, you can go to this kind of multi-computer server stuff called a Neo. That's not Neo 4J, that's Neo. And they do 70 terabytes of data in production. That's a lot of data. And they do 150 terabytes in increasing and test. So, so it'll scale very nicely. In terms of security, Z, Z, ZODB now does encryption between Zeo clients and Zeo servers. And if you need more security than that, there's a wonderful product that's a fork of it called ZeroDB. Um, what they do is they encrypt and decrypt everything, even the indexes on the client. And so the server doesn't know anything about what's in the database. It just has the encrypted values. And for example, if you have to host on Microsoft Azure, that's all on the cloud. They want to sell your private information. Don't just use something like ZeroDB so they don't know anything about what you're doing. Lots of different platforms use it. Plone, um, Grok, you can do it. There's a Flask interface. Um, Pyramid also uses it. Uh, here's what the Plone interface looks like. I don't want to spend too much time there doing the next talk. Uh, Pyramid um, has an interface called Substance D, and so what that does is it allows you to look at a, a, a node, a category, um, a container of objects, a dictionary of objects, and you can you know, choose which one you want to operate on. You can edit it, change the name, add, delete, do various, rename it, various operations, paste it, cut and paste it. Um, what I did with it is I did Zopachi, which is really a um, through the web integrated development environment. So you can edit your HTML either with a WYSIWYG editor or with an ACE technical editor. You can edit a CSS. You can edit JavaScript. So it's kind of, um, it's sort of for single developers, very fast prototyping through the internet. Hope to release it as a Docker container. I worry a bit about the time, but. Um, OK, now I'm going to skip a bunch of slides. So maybe a, I think it's about time. So let's just take it. Any questions on that? And if not, I can talk. Go ahead. How can you make a, <coughs> like a select queries for Zoop on the back inside Zoop, uh, inside the record? Right. So, um, so each record just has an ID, right? To do a select, what you need to do is you need to create an index. So you can create an index which says, for this weight, for these weights, go to this object. So you, so you create a second not just the, the index that comes with it for the ID, but you have to create additional indexes. And there are two sets of tools for do that. You can either use um, Z Catalog, or in the pyramid world, what they use is they use something called Hipatia. Go ahead, another question? Just speak, because I'm looking for something while we do this. OK, well, nobody's showing up for the next one, so let me just keep going. Maybe my, I'm a little bit ahead of time. Um, so how does this compare with Plone? So there's some interesting ideas here. Plone is a content management system. So lots of people can add content. In 2000, when it was released, um, that's what you needed. Nowadays, there's so many good, please sit down, please sit down. I'm wrapping this up. Um, what this software does, it does content aggregation. So you can merge software from multiple different places. And I'll just keep going for another slide or two. Because we started a bit late, there's a problem with the interest. So the reason that you can do this merging is because it's got two trees. In Plone, you just have a single tree. But this actually has two copies of the objects. And one is the, um, one is the publicly visible thing uh, copy. But you also have like a secondary copy, which is when you're merging information from each source, you have a copy. And that way, when that information changes, it's really easy to merge the differences. Um, and then the other big difference between this and Plone is in Plone, you have to navigate the different segments to get to an object. But what I have are canonical URLs. So on the categories, each category, there's only, um, there's no sharing of names. Each category has a unique name. So it's possible to, to put a dictionary at the root. And from that, it's possible to access any of the um, individual objects that you want to. 
So that's a canonical URL. Plone doesn't have that. That's one of the differences. Um, and I'll skip. And then the big thing, the big reason you want to use ZODB is because it makes it so much cheaper to put up websites. So uh, in this directory world, the two big competitors, Zeef and GLX, they both spent literally millions of euros or millions of dollars. I spent less than one twentieth of that. And my solution's way better. If you, they only have like two or three level hierarchies. If you look at the, I'm trying to index all of the Python um, blog postings. There, I estimate about 16,000. If you try to put that into a two-level directory, you end up getting 400 categories with 400 items. It's just too much. You want to keep it down to about seven items as a basic principle in human factors. And so parts of my Python directory go 10 levels deep to keep it very easy for people to use. Almost done here. Lots of different databases. And we'll just do one last thing. So my friend Grok says, quit using a Stone Age database. Download the ZODB today. Thank you. I don't know if there are any other questions. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Sure. Go ahead. Good. I love questions. It's a great question. So one of the slides I missed, I'll actually give that, is how do you compare it to other databases? And so one of the problems with MongoDB is it doesn't do transactions properly. So if you want to do a transaction across multiple documents, MongoDB, I believe, will not do it correctly. So there are a number of things, if you're comparing databases, there are a number of things you have to ask. One is, do they do transactions correctly? Do they represent a graph correctly? Let's see, what else do we have here? Sorry, my. Um, do they support pers persistent Python? For example, Neo4j is in Java, so it's statically bound. So you can't just, at runtime, add an instance variable to one of the Java objects, I believe, because it's statically bound. So, and then the last thing you need to check is, um, and do they support history? So, so what I would say to somebody who's considering MongoDB is don't, because you don't. Um, it doesn't do transactions correctly. Now, if you have to, ZODB actually has a transaction manager, so it will do a transaction correctly across MongoDB and, and itself using a two-phase commit, but I can't guarantee that MongoDB will do it correctly. Any other questions? Yeah, that's a really good question. So typically, people have relational databases, and they have this Python object model, right? And what we're saying is, and then what you end up doing is you end up having a relational model, you have the object model, and you have an ORM between the two. And we're saying just get rid of the relational model, get rid of the ORM, just do a persistent Python, and it just simplifies your work so much, it reduces the complexity, speeds development, brings down your costs, allows you to do a much better service than your competitors. Um, Maybe what we need is not an ORM, but an ROM, so that you can make the ZODB look like a relational database. OK, that could be done. It should be done. There are actually some Python libraries that kind of do that. You know, if I was more in marketing, I'd do it, but I'm not. I'm just. <laughs> Another question? OK, thank you. Oh, sorry. Do you have a? No. Um, Give me a second. Well, so the basic thing is you start off with a single ZODB, right? Then you can move to ZO clients. Read performance is really good. There used to be a problem with write performance because it wrote to only a single file. But now the write performance, what they've done is they've taken some of the techniques from, Neo, from the Neo database, and they can write to multiple files. So write performance is also very good. Um, you know, the question is, how does it compare like PostgreSQL? Um, yeah, I, I, you know, check, check, but I, it's, it's reasonable. It's not, there's not a performance problem. Um, I guess w what happens is um, you have to look at your application, right? Because if you have multiple people who are all accessing sort of the same objects, um, you're going to run into contention. But if everyone's accessing very different sets of objects and up updating different sets, you'll be just fine. So. So forgive me, I don't have an excellent answer for that. But to a first approximation, your performance should be fine. You know, talk to me about your particular application. I'll tell you if you know, there are any alarm bells that go off. OK, well, they're plotting next time. So. Do I have the time correctly here? Let me just make sure. It's on 24. Yeah, that's right. OK. OK.
thank you.